fascinating. And one of the other things that Gannon mentioned yesterday, whether this is entirely accurate or whether he meant to kind of convey this or not, he dropped Howie Roseman's name as being part of the game plan. That he, scares he, me. Which it, it it's kind of confirming what anybody who's been around the team for a while kind of regarded as an open secret, which is Howie's involvement in how the Eagles play once yeah. he provides the players that they play with. Thank you for hanging with us on this Wednesday. Welcome back, everybody. We are Sports Take, Jacob Sports YouTube Network. Derek Gunn, Barrett Brooks, Rob Ellis. Love having our next guest on. He did a double dip. He was. This is Yeoman's work today in the Philadelphia Inquirer. You could follow him on Twitter at Mike Sealski. Of course, his work there at the Inquirer.com. But he had a nice little double dip today between the the Eagles and Jonathan Gannon in a, in a really good piece, which we'll talk about a little bit later with a uh, tragedy that hit quite a while ago at the, uh, at the Bucks County Langhorn uh, racetrack. So Mike, first off, good work today, man. You, you took up, uh, I was in, I was sitting waiting for my oil to be changed and I, I got old school with the actual newspaper versus <laughs> reading you digitally. And man, you were everywhere on that front page. I am King of all media, Ross. Yes, yes. Um, and it's it's funny you said that because I did exactly the same thing. I was getting my oil changed this morning, <laughs> and I was I had my laptop with me, and I was Dang. just you know yep. engaged in reading about the Eagles and all kinds of stuff. Yes, we 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 are like minds. Uh, so Mike, let, let's start with this. Uh, we'll, we'll get to your other piece in a minute, which was excellent. I uh, see you get a lot of love from there from the race world as well on that. But uh, let's start with Jonathan Gannon because I I think part of it is Mike. There was a lot of preconceived. Uh, angst going into the season directed towards him by fans. Okay. We, we just, they weren't happy the way last year went and they're sort of waiting to pounce a little bit. Now he did nothing to help that. Okay. I think he put a little fuel to the fire here, but, and you, you mentioned how this guy handles himself. Great. He's smooth in a press conference, man. You could see why NFL teams are kind of wooed a little bit, but ultimately it's about the product on the field. What was your sense being there on Sunday? What that product was all about? My sense was that the product stunk. Um, that was my sense. I mean, I'm not sure other than the James Bradbury interception for a touchdown, how you could come away thinking anything else. Uh, Hassan Reddick, the big offseason acquisition, made two tackles, uh, didn't really get anywhere close to the quarterback. Jordan Davis, uh, the first round pick who we all saw in the preseason and training camp looked terrific, got on the field for only 22 snaps. Uh, now, it's possible that he's not in good enough shape and conditioning yet that, you know, 22 snaps is all he could play. But if you look at the numbers, he seemed to make a difference in the Lions running game when he was out there. And yet, you know, the Eagles allow 35 points and all the questions that we had about Jonathan Gannon last season as to whether it's him or it's the personnel and why is he playing so conservatively and all those things, all those questions still remain. And now you have new ones. Um, to me, the big one, Rob, and, and I know Derek and Barrett are familiar with this idea from, you know, Barrett from playing in the league and Derek from covering it as long as he has is to me, the question about Gannon is what does he trust more? Does he trust his scheme more or does he trust the actual players? Um, the, the examples that I keep coming back to in this regard are this. Everybody knew Jim Johnson when he was with the Eagles was a terrific defensive coordinator. OK, that didn't stop Jim Johnson when he got Brian Dawkins from saying, that guy is special. What do I have to do to maximize that guy? Okay. Mm -hmm. I covered the Jets for a couple of years when they had Darrell Revis as one of their two starting cornerbacks, when Revis was the top corner in the NFL. They literally said, and this was Rex Ryan, who was regarded as a top defensive mind, basically said like, look, I'm not going to try to reinvent the wheel here. Darrell Revis will take that half of the field. And so we don't have to worry about it. And as, long as, and as long as we're operating from that, then we can figure out what else we need to do. I don't see Gannon doing that. I don't see Gannon looking at the talent that he has and saying, okay, I know Hassan Reddick can do this, or I know this guy can do that. What do I have to do to maximize that and then adjust accordingly? I see a guy who's kind of, at least so far, really married to his scheme. And it's a common scheme, this multiple Vic Fangio alignment, but it doesn't seem to be working to me and I don't see any adjustments yet from Gannon. Maybe I'm wrong. Mm. You mute it, Gunner. 
It's, it's funny you should bring up Brian Dawkins because when we had him on the show earlier this spring and we asked him about his relationship with Jim Johnson, he brought up the fact that when his career really took off was when he would have those conversations with Jim and as good of a defensive coordinator as Jim was, you know, Jim, what do you like to do? How do you feel more comfortable in the system? Let's play to your strengths. As I'm looking at the transcript from yesterday, and you were a part of the media contingent that was asking Gannon questions, I liked how you asked him about how, how do you approach this? Is it by down and distance or is it personnel groupings in terms of how many people, certain people you need on the field more so than others? And I'm looking at his answer, and I'm still trying to piecemeal his answer together. I came away thinking, huh? How, how did you feel about the answer he gave you? I didn't like it, Gunner. He didn't answer the question. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. I, I, what, what I was getting at was exactly what you and I just talked about, the idea yeah. of what matters more, the scheme or the personnel, mm -hmm. and, and how are you operating. And one of the other things that Gannon mentioned yesterday, whether this is entirely accurate or whether he meant to kind of convey this or not, he dropped Howie Roseman's name as being part of the game plan. That he, scares he, me. Which it, 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 it's kind of confirming what, anybody who's been around the team for a while kind of regarded as an open secret, which is how he's involvement in how the Eagles play once yeah. he provides the players that they play with. And I wonder if this is all kind of a way for the decision makers, Howie, Nick Sirianni, Jonathan Gannon to kind of be able to deflect blame, you know, Hey, we're all on the same page when it comes to the scheme and how we want to do this. We just need to make plays. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, sometimes you just need playmakers, right? And if Jordan Davis is giving you indications that he's a playmaker when the opposing offense runs the ball and the Detroit Lions are gashing you in the run game, you know, I, you don't have to be like a brainiac to put Jordan Davis in the game and maybe mm -hmm. stop the run. Or mm -hmm. if Hassan Reddick is a double-digit sack guy, don't have him drop into coverage 20% of the time, which it looks like some of the numbers are showing that he did. So I, I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe I'm not that bright, but it just seems to me like th there's a, there's a uh, devotion to the scheme that doesn't seem to be taking advantage of so far of the talent that the Eagles have. Mike on the Howie thing. And uh, Barrett, I'm sorry. I would just, let me jump in real quick, just to pick up on that. D do you sense that there's any kind of, Hey, look, playing, paying Fetch Fletcher Cox a hell of a lot of money paying Javon Hargrave a hell of a lot of money, whatever. Should they be in there in lieu of a rookie? I mean, it's a, it's a weird juxtaposition because if you're Howie, you also dra drafted that guy in the first round, Jordan Davis. Like mm -hmm. I, I I'm trying to, I, I'm trying to come to grips with exactly what it is there. Is there the, Hey, we paying these guys big bucks. They have to play edict or at least influence, or is it, wouldn't you also look good if that rookie's kicking ass? Like I'm trying to figure out exactly what the, what the mix is here. Yeah, I don't know yet either, Robin. I'm not sure they do either. Yeah. I think, you know, part of this is you got to see what Fletcher has left and you've got to see how Davis performs over the course of a full season. Um, you know, it is just one game. And the one caveat I'll allow with respect to Gannon and the 35 points against the Lions is that it's week one and week one can be crazy in the NFL. I get that. And who knows, maybe five, six, 10 weeks from now, we're going to look back at this game and the Lions will be seven and three and we'll be saying, hey, that that win looks a whole lot better than it does, you know, the way we're talking about it now. But all these things are possible, it seems to me. And you look at the snap count from that game and you see that Jordan Davis got fewer snaps than anybody. Uh, you know, it, it just doesn't jibe with the performance, at least through one week. So, yes, let's see. But I think these are fair questions to ask. Mm. Well, you know, when, when you look Eric, at, uh, muted, by the way, when you when you look at, um, if 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 it is true that Howie is involved in a defensive game plan, that's scary. You go back to the Doug Peterson tenure, and it was Howie Roseman who was set the forty six man roster every week, and Doug had a problem with that. When the GM basically sets your fifty your forty six man roster on a game day for a game day, when the coaching staff is out there coaching these guys, has a much better feel for who could be in, should be in, you know. I'm, I think if, if that is true, to me, the general manager is wearing way too many hats. Yeah, I mean, look, Gunnar, I think this is what the Eagles do and have done for a long time. The question becomes, how long does it go before somebody bristles, right? Mm -hmm. Like that happened with Doug, mm -hmm. okay? He bristled at it, and it was yep. one of the many reasons that he ended up getting fired. Um, 
you know, maybe he could have saved his job if Carson Wentz had not tanked. And I don't mean like thrown games. I mean, just played terribly during right, the 2020 right. season. But the fact is Wentz played terribly and it was another pebble on the pile as to why they felt like Doug couldn't stay or Doug didn't want to stay. Mm-hmm. Um, Sirianni and Gannon don't yet have the kind of cachet where they can push back, even if they were to disagree. Right. Um, you know, so I, I think I'd say the same thing to you that I said to Rob. We have to see how this all plays mm-hmm. out. If Kirk Cousins and Justin Jefferson come out and torch them for 45 on Monday night and Jefferson catches 10 balls for 200 yards, you know, that's one thing. If they shut out the Vikings and sack Cousins eight times and Hassan Reddick has his day of days, that's something else. So mm-hmm. we'll see. I think you might be having mic issues, man. Yeah. Yep. We, can yep. you guys hear him, Mike? No. 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 All right. Yeah, you're no. you're uh, yeah, something's, something's Xander, wrong let's with uh, mic. let's work with Barrett. I, I, I don't talk to Barrett anyway. <laughs> I, I don't want to talk to Barrett. I don't want to. He did that. He did it. I'm telling you, he's got that kind of power to control microphones. Um so Mike, other than that, a couple a couple other odds and ends just to take away from that game before we jump into a couple other things. Um certainly positives in that AJ Brown goes nuts. I mean, he absolutely goes off. And they appear to have something really special in terms of a chemistry. He and Hertz. Um, this does feel to ish, you know. And I, I'm not big on throwing that kind of stuff around, but it does kind of have that that vibe to it. I, I agree with you, Rob. I mean, it was it was really just from a pure football standpoint. If you appreciate watching a great wide receiver play, it was fun to watch AJ Brown on Sunday. That guy, after he caught the ball, he immediately started creating instant urban mm-hmm. renewal throughout mm-hmm. Detroit. He was just, you know, knocking tacklers off. It was it was amazing um, yeah. to see that. And the fact that they put up 31 offensive points without Devontae Smith catching a pass is is a feather in their cap, right? Um, there are some things that they have to clean up. Look, I thought Hertz was very, very good. Um, he wasn't perfect. There were some passes he had batted down. There were some throws that were not great, but all in all, he was really, really good. You saw the dimension that his running brings to the offense and how it frustrates an opposing defense and keeps them off balance. Uh, You saw that Miles Sanders can be a productive back. Um, So yeah, you know, generally all good things there. And the offensive line, I didn't think I I thought didn't play great early in the game because they couldn't hear. I mean, it was so loud in Ford field. Um, Was it legitimately loud, Mike? You were there. Yeah, it was. I I said this to somebody yesterday. I had a throbbing headache throughout the Mm. game, and I think it was because of the noise. Um, I was walking up and down press row, like begging one of the other writers to give me some ibuprofen. (laughs) I was I was dying, Um, and I think it was the noise. So um, there are some things, as Sirianni said, that they can they can improve on offensively, even though they put up thirty one. Mike, you're 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 good. You good. No, you still have an audio issue. Sorry, bud. It's still muted. Mike, uh, your, th- your thoughts on the way um, 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 Miles Sanders seemed to carry the ball with a purpose uh, on Sunday? He, he absolutely did, Gunner. Um, that, that run at the end of the game that really kind of, you know, gave the Eagles some breathing room there when things were really nerve-wracking, the Lions had just made it 38-35, and you're saying to yourself, oh, my gosh, are they going to be able to run out the clock here? And, it's, and he breaks that big run when it looks like he stopped – uh, he ran hard. He ran between the tackles. Uh, yep. You know, he didn't fumble, which is something that had been kind of a bugaboo for him in the past. I was impressed with Miles on Sunday, mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. that's a good thing. You know, it's a very good thing. They've got three backs who y- you like. You know, they can each do different kinds of things. Kenny Gainwell looked okay, too, after having mm-hmm. kind of a rough uh, preseason in training camp. And we know what Boston Scott is. He can do a lot of different things. can catch the ball out of the backfield. Uh, was good in blitz mm-hmm. pickup, I thought. Uh, so, you know, the, the very good showing I thought by their running backs, Mike, mm-hmm. let's talk about Hertz. Um, you know, a, a great day on the ground and really in a lot of ways, the offensive line, you just referenced, he bailed them out. I mean, there was a, I, there aren't many quarterbacks that would have escaped some of that. And he did an amazing job doing what he had to do to get them a win. The thing that, that worries you is man, he took some hits. And, and the last one was was obviously the one that stands out because they finally threw, threw a flag. I think he could have justified it maybe two other times. And I think, I, you know, there's a lot of talk, oh, people being critical of Hurts. I think it's more of, can this sustain itself is more of the question with Hurts. And that's kind of where I'm going with you. Like, is this survivable here for 17? Man, Rob, for Jalen Hurts' sake and the Eagles' sake, I hope so. Because 
I mean, literally the first play offensive play of the game, he carried the ball on a read option and they did not hide the fact at all that he is the nexus of their offense and they are going to run RPOs with him because that's what he feels most comfortable with. And in a weird way, Sirianni is kind of doing the opposite of what Jonathan Gannon seems to be doing, Mm. which is he's saying, this is what Jalen Hurts does well. I'm going to maximize what Jalen Hurts does well for as long as I possibly can. Now, here's my concern. I think I think Hurts is adept, and Shane Steichen said this yesterday, Hurts is adept at avoiding the big hit, generally speaking. Yep. But what we've seen so far in the preseason and the hit he took in that Jets game and the three or four hits that he took after he had given himself up That's right. That's in right. that Lions game is, man – you just don't know. I just wonder if there's going to be a player out, a defensive player out there is going to say, you know what? I'm going to hit him anyway. And it's, and it's worth, I'll take the risk that they throw the flag, but if he leaves the offense, then the Eagles have to adjust and change. And they can't really do things the way that they seem to want to do them. Now, you know, maybe Gardner Minshew comes in there and there are aspects of the offense that, that run better than they do with Hertz. But I don't think that's a chance that the Eagles want to take, especially based on the way Hurts looked in that game Sunday. He was very good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought the other the they've almost gone the Lamar Jackson route, where you remember for a little while they weren't quite sure, you know, how they were going to approach things. And, and Harbaugh just said, "You know what? Screw it. We are playing to this guy. We're all in. It, there's going to be a lot of running. We'll take the risk. This is what it's going to be." I feel like the Eagles and Mike the on that. I, I think a lot of us thought, well. They, they want to pass the ball more. They, that's who Jeffrey Lurie is. That's who Howie Roseman is. That's probably who Nick Sirianni is at heart. And I thought there'd be less of what we saw. Some of this uh, Sunday was just, you know, survival, right? Mm-hmm. But I thought we would see more of a concerted effort to throw the ball. Not that they didn't with A.J. Brown. Are you surprised that there is all in, at least for that game, with that approach? A little bit, Rob, I am. But I also think that if you think about it in the long term, it makes more sense. And here's why. One of the big discussion topics that we've been batting around throughout the offseason and we will continue discussing it throughout this season is Jalen Hurts' future, okay? Is he going to be the long-term answer at quarterback? And one of the dynamics that we always talk about is, well, the Eagles have draft picks so that if they feel like Jalen Hurts isn't the guy, they can go draft somebody. Well, what if you're Nick Sirianni in the Eagles and you're saying to yourselves, you know what? If we can go get somebody else in the draft next year, why not just wring every drop of Jalen Hurts as he is out of him this season? You know, we'll develop him as a passer as much as we can, but the bottom line is he excels in the RPO game. He can run. As we said, he keeps defenses on their heels. Let's just maximize that and see what happens. And if he stays healthy, great. And if he gets hurt, obviously we don't want him to get hurt, but we are positioned that we can move on or add another option if we need to. And I I can't help but think that's got to be on their minds, particularly with respect to Sirianni and Steichen in terms of how they're using it. Hey, Mike, I brought this up on the show yesterday. When it comes to Boston Scott, does it surprise you in some ways he's like a forgotten entity in his offense? I I understand they draft a game well and they want to get their money's worth out of him. But, But Boston Scott is their best blocker. He's a hard runner. I think he's the hardest runner, um, especially in short yard of situation. He does everything that you're asking. He can catch the ball out of the backfield. But for whatever reason, he's always the forgotten entity in his offense. And he didn't really get his reps last year until Miles Sanders got hurt. Yeah, I wonder about that, Gunner. I wonder if they just look at Boston. And I'm with you. I'm a big Boston Scott yeah. fan. Yeah. Um, I, I like what he gives the offense. I think he's great, a great teammate, great person, um, all those things. And I just wonder if they feel like, you know, He's reliable, right? Yeah, like yeah. after Sanders broke that one run that late mm-hmm. in the game, they went right back to Boston for the next yeah. three handoffs. It's like, okay, you know, he made that one mistake, that fumble against the Giants last season, and everybody was taken aback because he usually doesn't do that. He's usually where he's supposed to be, doing what he's supposed to do. And I think they just kind of look at him that way. Like, hey, if when we need him, Boston will be there. And in the meantime – Let's get Gainwell his. Let's get Sanders his. Let's throw the mm-hmm. ball to Goddard and Brown and Devontae and all these guys. And when we need Boston, he'll be there. All right, Mike. So they will, and Gannon did it again yesterday, they will never cop to, hey, we, we didn't put enough work in, in in the preseason. But you saw a team that was sloppy with tackling. They committed 10 penalties 
a bunch that were pre-snap, uh, an offensive line that didn't look prepared for when, when extra bodies were sent at them. All of those are earmarks of a team that isn't necessarily ready. And I get it's week one. We could probably nitpick every single game in the NFL. I get that. However, you know, if we're just talking about the Eagles here, it did sort of feel like that. What was your sense there? A little bit, yeah. I mean, you could say a lot of the same things about the Lions, too. And, yeah. you know, the entire country watched Dan Campbell rah-rah and hoo-ha, you know, and hit everybody uh, during training camp on hard knocks. So I think, look, this is par for the course and it should be expected. These teams more and more are using the opening weeks of the season to get themselves into shape. They just take it as, yeah, the games count. Of course they count and we want to win them, but we're just kind of going to survive them until week three, week four, we really start to become the team we're going to be. And I think the NFL as a whole has kind of reconciled itself to this measure of sloppiness in these early games and fans are going to have to live with it. And maybe if they had hit more during training camp, they wouldn't have been as sloppy. Mm -hmm. It's like trying to prove a negative, right? Yeah. You're never going to know. Mm -hmm. So you take it for what it is. You say to yourself, okay, the defense looked very similar to the defense from last season, which to me is a concern, but in the end they got a win on the road. And I think they'll take that. Mm -hmm. How did you like the way they used uh, C.J. Gardner-Johnson? I mean, he only got here just less than a couple of weeks ago and put him right in the fire. Yeah, look, that's why they got him. I, I think the same sort of principle kind of applies, Gunner. You're not going to ease him into this. Might as yeah. well throw him out there and, and you know, get him into the flow of things rather than hold him out or limit his snaps. He's a veteran guy. Uh, they went after him for a reason. And get him out there and get him his reps so that by week three, week four, It'll all be second nature to them. Mm. Um, I, I th that's where I, th I come down on this. I think that's probably the way they're thinking too. Mike, what, what just overall as we go forward here, based off of what you've seen, what you thought prior to, do you chalk up a lot of the issues to it's week one, goofy things happen, they escaped with a win, that's the bottom line, they're going to be fine, or you saw some things that are a little bit more troubling? I saw one thing that was troubling, and it's a big thing, which is the defense. Mm. Um, the rest of it I'm able to chalk up to, man, I, I've been, I've covered half a dozen football games in Detroit. I have never seen an environment like that in four field ever. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it caught the Eagles off guard in that respect, how loud it was and how disconcerting that was to them trying to run their offense. I think, you know, Devonte Smith is not going to go the rest of the season, not getting a catch. Mm -hmm. um, and the offensive line isn't going to look that shaky for much of the, uh, the season. So most of this you chalk up to hey, week one, they'll be fine. Uh, the defense though, is it going to get better? Probably will get better, but there's no proof of that yet. I mean, it just, the 19 games that Jonathan Gannon has coached with the Eagles, including the, the playoff game last year against Tampa Bay, the Eagles have allowed 27 points or more nine times. Mm -hmm. And you look at the 10 games that they didn't, where their defensive stats were good and they, they only gave up so many points, man, some, some not so good quarterbacks, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. that those ben DiNucci, who, could for, who could forget about our guy, yeah. Ben DiNucci. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. guys like that, you know, yeah. or, or Matt Ryan in week one last year before the Falcons kind of figured things out as much as they could figure things out. So yeah. um, that's my concern. Yeah. Were you surprised okay. that Kobe Dean only saw the field three snaps? I wasn't Gunner. Okay. I think they're going to, they're going to ease him in and, Look, he came in, he's one of these guys, I think genuinely came in a little ballyhooed. Mm -hmm. And in camp, he was okay. Like, he didn't jump out at you in practice or the games as a guy who, oh my goodness, we, we, they got to get him on the field. Right. Jordan right. Davis did. I didn't see N'Kobe Dean in that respect. So I, if we're going to see increased levels of snaps and numbers of snaps for N'Kobe Dean, um, mm -hmm. I think it's going to take some time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Mike, before I want to get to your piece to uh, your other piece in the inquiry today, but uh, quickly, your Phillies thoughts, but down to 21 games at this point here um, and have been able to sort of withstand a couple of storms in terms of injuries with Harper and Wheeler with a guy like Bailey Falter really stepping up uh, in your estimation, a playoff team and a playoff team potentially, if so, with any hope of getting past the first round. A, I think they're a playoff team. Uh, B, Bailey Falter makes me think of Marty Bystrom for yes. all you longtime Phillies fans when Bystrom came up in 1980 and went 5-0 and mm -hmm. helped the Phillies win the pennant and win the World Series. Uh, yeah, I think they're a playoff team, Rob. I do. Um, and I think that 
I would give them a decent shot in the first round because it's a best of three situation. And assuming Zach Wheeler is healthy, and I know Phillies fans have their fingers crossed about that, I'll take Zach Wheeler and Aaron Nola okay. in, in a short series. I will. I, I know Nola's history in September. I get it. Look at his overall numbers this season. He's been really, really good. Uh, he's generally been really, really good uh, since he's been a Philly. I'll take my chances with that uh, because anything can happen in a best of three series, even though the Phillies are going to be playing uh, on the road for all of that series. So we'll see. Okay. I, I just thought of something off of that real quick. Uh, you you kind of soured on baseball. They've made some, they're going to make some serious rule changes next year. One of them is a pitch clock and a, and essentially the batter's got to be ready to go too. Will that help bring you back if you see it speeding the game up? I'm definitely curious to see how the, the rules changes affect the sport, okay. especially the lack of shifts. Mm-hmm. My, one of my biggest complaints about baseball now is the lack of diversity of styles of play. I loved stolen bases. I loved doubles and triples. I want to see them again. They are the most exciting plays in baseball. The mm-hmm. home run's been kind of de-emphasized because there's so many of them nowadays. Uh, I want to see a ball hit in the gap. Uh, the most exciting Phillies moment I've ever been a part of, or not a part of, but I witnessed was Jimmy Rollins walk off double against the Dodgers in game four of the 2009 league championship series. There's a ball up the gap. Is Carlos Ruiz going to be able to score from first base to win this game and turn the series in the Phillies direction? You don't see plays like that often enough anymore. I want to see more of them. Mike, are you surprised in a lot of ways how the back end of the lineup at many times, especially as of late as Alshine, the, front, the top part of that order, Maton last night, is the game-winning home run? You need that, Gunner. You yep. need guys who come off the bench and get big hits. Go back to 07, 08, 09. Mm-hmm. How many times did guys like Greg Dobbs and, you know, Iguchi and So Taguchi, Tadahito yeah. Iguchi and So Taguchi and – um, all these guys, Jeff Jenkins, all these yep. guys at the end of the bench come up big. Um, you know, Eric Bruntlett for, yeah. for crying out yep. loud. So yep. um, does it surprise me? A little bit, just because these guys haven't done it before. Um, but mm-hmm. you need you need hits like the home run that Maton hit last night to get yourself into the playoffs and infuse a team with some confidence they can do damage once they get there. Mm. All right, Mike, lastly, you wrote a piece today. One of your other pieces today was about a NASCAR driver, last name Mann, uh, which was a changed name, in fact, but uh, who died at a very dangerous racetrack in, in, by, in the Langhorn area in Bucks County 70 years ago. Just let people know kind of what the gist of this thing is. Sure, Rob. I, I love stories like this. I love <clears> going <throat> back in a time and taking a look at a moment that we've forgotten. So in 1952, uh, Langhorn Speedway, you know, right off of Route 1 in Bucks County, in Lower Bucks County, was the equivalent of Daytona or Indianapolis Speedway. It was huge. It was also the most dangerous, treacherous racetrack in America, bar none. Mm -hmm. Um, Dusty, the the track itself was on springs. They poured, used motor oil on it to try to harden it up. It was crazy. And the very first time a driver died in a NASCAR race was at Langhorne Speedway 70 years ago today. The guy's name was Larry Mann. Mm-hmm. His actual name was Lawrence Zuckerman. He grew up in Queens and Jamaica, Queens, which mm-hmm. doesn't exactly sound like a hotbed of NASCAR, but it's true. <laughs> yeah. And uh, his car flipped over a bunch of times and he died. And I just wrote this piece about how, you know, we don't think of the Philadelphia area as big into stock car racing, but it used to be. And here's this momentous occasion. Um, this very sad tragedy. And this guy, Larry Mann, has been kind of consigned to obscurity forever. And I just wanted to kind of tell that story. I thought it was really kind of cool. Um, And just a reminder of the way sports used to be and kind of the nature of danger uh, that we used to take for granted in a lot of sports like NASCAR, football, things like that. So, so Mike, what made you research and and write such an in-depth story like that? Because I, I thought it was a great read. I just love doing stuff like that, Gunner. Thanks. And, yeah. and I happened across um, uh, somebody else had written a story about Langhorn Speedway that I just happened to stumble across. And in there, it mentioned that Larry Mann had died in 1952. And anytime I see a, a milestone or a piece of in, historical information like that, I immediately go like, oh, is the anniversary coming up? And is, it sounds mm-hmm. interesting. Can I possibly write about it? And I happened to cross this story a couple of months ago and I'm like, oh, well, the 70th anniversary is coming up. 
yep. it's a perfect time to to do some research and write about it. Great, uh, Mike, great, great, great stuff, man. And, and 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 keep up the good work. Do you have an event tonight too? That you want to? We do. So so yeah. So Glenn Mack now from WIP, who's tied up, you know, part owner of the Conchock and Brewing Company, is having an event tonight at Puddler's Kitchen and Tap in Bridgeport, Pennsylvania, from six to eight thirty. The brewery is. Uh, releasing, they're having a release party tonight for their new beer, Merrill and Mike's Philly Special W. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. IPA. Yes. So it's named after Merrill Reese and Mike Quick. It's a double IPA. So if you have one, it'll knock you on your butt. <laughs> and uh, they're they're going to have an, a, a terrific auction tonight. Uh, they're they're auctioning off Ray Dittinger's notes, draft notes oh, from, from all the current Eagles and a Dr. J autographed jersey. I'm going to be there with Zach Berman. We're going to be signing our our books. Zach's book was uh, Underdogs about the 2017 Eagles and the Super Bowl. My book was The Rise about Kobe Bryant. Mm -hmm. uh, Fran Dunphy's going to be there. They're auctioning off a lunch with Dunf and Phil Martelli. It's going to be an awesome event. It's free to get in. The beer and the food aren't free, and the, the auction isn't free, but everything else is. And So if you're available tonight and can come on out, please do. It's going to be a great event. Uh, and the proceeds go to mm -hmm. Uh, a charity that Merrill and Mike picked uh, first Philly first tea. I believe it's called. It's a, it's a charity that gets kids who wouldn't otherwise be exposed to golf involved in golf and nice. introduces them to the yeah. sport and gets them involved yeah. with it. So it's all really great. Hey, hey Mike, by the way, you and Glenn do an incredible job complimenting each other on your broadcast. Uh, and, and I think you were the perfect choice to fill that role that uh, Ray Dittinger gave up. So kudos to you, because when it was announced that you were going to uh, be the co-host with uh, Glenn Mack now, first thing I thought, I said, who better, who who knows Philadelphia sports better than Mike Sielski? And, and sure enough, the, the few times I've had an opportunity to listen, it's not been disappointing. Gunnar, I really appreciate that, man. And I have to give all the credit to Glenn. He has made the transition very, very easy. Yeah. Uh, I give a lot of credit to Ray, who – you know, signed off on this and gave it his blessing. And I'm very grateful for that. And and we're just having fun with the show and yeah. I'm not trying to be Ray. I'm just trying to be me. And I'm, yeah. if people are enjoying that, then I'm very grateful. Last He's thing you're you, throw man. your cell yeah. phone away and just wear khakis. I mean, that's probably <laughs> no way, man. I'm, I'm the opposite. Of, I am the opposite of Ray. I love wearing jeans. I wear I jeans every chance I can get. Just what yeah. I'm hearing out there. I don't know. Mike. <laughs> uh, anyway, Mike, we appreciate it, man. Thanks for a couple. Thank minutes. you, man. Guys, it's always such a pleasure. Thank right. you so much. Yeah. Take care. That's Take Mike Sealski. You can check him out on Twitter at Mike Sealski. And of course, his work, inquirer.com, as Gunnar mentioned on uh, Saturdays <laughs> with uh, Glenn Macnow on WIP. All right, let's get a quick timeout. We'll get Barrett straight now. You back? You good? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, you there me? you go. Yeah. Gotcha, man. Gotcha. We're happy to have you back. Yeah. All good. All good from here on out. So we'll, we'll get some of your thoughts on some of the things we're bouncing off of Mike when we come back, Barrett. All right. We'll do that. Uh, a little fellas. We got a lot of NFL stuff too. Hey, the, the Lions actually grabbed up your guy, uh, Coyote Awasika. Yeah. Yes. He has been grabbed up by the Lions for what it's worth. So uh, I just wanted to pass that. Along. You see what happened to Big V having back surgery? No, he's got to have yeah, surgery. Yeah, he's got to have back surgery. That. Oh. That's a mm, He made That's enough money. <laughs> he did get paid he did get paid that's five right. years 50 million dollars nice good for him yeah he, he he uh that's that's tough break though all right we'll come oh, back i like, like silski man silski's my guy hey, why are you acknowledging that stuff dude <laughs> 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 i knew you were gonna say something when it popped up say oh geez, uh, geez. We <laughs> sorry we're starting controversy no there's no beefs we don't have any beefs yet on our show we're good. We don't need that. All right, so we'll come back. We'll uh, we'll we'll get Barrett's reaction to some of the things that Mike had to say, and we'll dig in on on some Phillies, some NFL. Uh, we've got all kinds of stuff in terms of the open talk as well. Don't go anywhere. Derek Gunn, Barrett Brooks, Rob Ellis. We're Sports Take, Jacob Sports YouTube Network. All right, let's talk about Razor Technology in particular, cybersecurity, protecting and your data is a security imperative for businesses of all sizes. Choose a partner like Razor Technology with expertise in the latest threats and proactive tools to lock down every endpoint with a zero trust approach that makes certain only authorized users gain access to your system. Razor delivers enterprise wide insight into every component of a security plan across identity, devices, information, apps, and infrastructure with threat prioritized recommendations. We design, deploy, manage, and monitor 
security solutions that enable modern business to safely communicate, collaborate, and thrive in the modern marketplace, whether they are working in person or remotely or internal infrastructure or in the cloud and in every possible hybrid arrangement. Choose Razor Technology to protect your digital assets, establish an organization-wide security posture, enforce safe practices for identity and access management, and secure hybrid and remote workforces as well. Call Razor Technology today at 866-797-3282, 866-797-3282, or visit them online at razor-tech.com. That's razor-tech.com. 